Welcome to the Startup Grind. Back 
happens and came back five years later. But what happened with us was that you know we sat in there. Uh, we said no. Our customers still need to be in the next day. And, you know they're, they're still there, etc. So you know let's stay put. And we also have 150 miles to feed. Uh, the problem was that income bank closed. So we would call up and it was just being uh, nobody would pick up the other line. And in, and in a certain company like cleaning, you have 80, 85 percent of your revenue goes to your, you know, uh, operational expenditures. So, so whatever you know, invoices you've been sending out, your own money would be standing there, all of them has to go to pay some salaries. Uh, uh, so, we lost all the money um, from one day to the other. And I had people to serve, I had mouths to feed, and I had uh, a business to take care of. So, um, of course, you are you're hit hard and you feel a tremendous you know, emptiness. You know, what is going on here? And how am I going to overcome this? And how am I going to move on from this? And then, you know, you, you have to take a step back and you have to look a little bit pragmatic and a little bit, you know, cold and, and analyze the situation. Okay, I analyze it. My customers are still here, they are still going to their offices. They still need clean toilets in the reception area, and they still need all this. So, the need for my services hadn't changed. None of those companies had left. It was American companies, and uh, and they had stayed put. It was property managers, so their properties were still there. You know, maybe some of the spaces were all occupied, but they were still need to maintain a building. If you got 100 million euros in a building, you still need to maintain it. Um, so, my problem was really maybe not so much my customer base. My problem was, you know, what am I doing with my expenditures and my, my employees? Um, and I took the bulls by the horn and I went out and met every single person. I went to every single customer we had, flipped the box, stood in the floor in the middle of the room, and I told everyone that, guys, we lost our money, we lost your salaries, we lost my salary if I, if I ever took a salary. Um, and I said to them, you know, there's a job for you, you know, this client wants to. But he's not going to pay the last invoice twice, he's going to pay the next invoice. And he's going to pay the next invoice again. So, if you're all willing to buy the bullet, um, come to work tomorrow. You know, there's a job for you and I will pay you half a salary on the next month. And then the following month I can pay you one full salary and then we're back up and running. There was not one person that didn't come next day to work. So, um, yes, take the emotions to make a little bit out of it. And this is something also I hear with like, you, you walk into a place and people have a doomsday face on and they are, and yes, I'm not neglecting that, it's, it is, but, you know, did you lose money, did you lose a million in the bank, did anyone want to lose a million in the bank? Most probably not, I didn't, no one really did. So, you know, what is different from what was it on the 25th of March to what it is today? Um, so, if you still want to go and buy your coffee and your magazine and, you know, continue your life, that's also what's going to help you. The mindset changed, and I, I imagine Russia was the same thing. And you could probably shed some light on that. Is that the minute something like this happens, people have to start thinking in a different way, especially the entrepreneurs or, or the people that are looking to do a startup or to be an entrepreneur probably have an opportunity. Sure, that this is how we see this. It's a cup half full and half empty. Um, with time, in, in the next six months or something, we will see some changes to, to everything. And whether, whether that be rent of office space, or the salary that we are going to pay our employees, or you know, the deals we can make with our you know, suppliers, or you know, even if people who are desperate for a job, maybe they want to get on board you know, just for a share in their company and work you know, hard without getting paid. It gives opportunities. Okay. What, what was the, in Russia when it happened, what was the, the time gap between the feeling that's, you know, oh shit, you know, everything's gone to hell. And then you start to see the country get back on its feet, you start to see the wheels turning. And how would you, is that relatable to what's happening? Is that as well? Do you think the same thing will happen going forward? Um, as I said, the immediate aftermath of, of all this crisis in Russia was that a lot of people left. You know, um, at that time, we were, we were talking with IKEA, we were talking with Oshan and Metro and all these um, big retailers. Um, IKEA stayed in, they stayed good, uh, but Metro and Oshan and some of the other ones, they uh, turned around and, and left Russia with, with the policy of, you know, we're not ready to get in. Um, and they came back actually almost five years later. Okay, then Metro, Oshan, 
how I started to come in, uh, maybe not five, maybe four years later. But, but the general sentiment uh, in the public, it, it took, I took, I would say, six months at least before people sort of you know, understood that there's a new, not new world order, but there's a new order in our uh, community. So, no, no, yes, and, and I would say that um, it hasn't hit people yet what's going to happen to society. You know, the layoffs, we haven't seen the layoffs yet. We haven't seen the, the, the drop in, in the need for financial services that is one of our largest industries. You know, so all this will have a number effect. That takes at least six months to sort of kick it. Yes. And so you had this is a team of co-founders that you were in Russia and, and how did you exit that space? So now the crisis is over, you guys are staying, you're growing the business. We actually we actually did that year nineteen we, we doubled our company because we stayed in. Then the competition obviously got less. Got a lot of market share. So so suddenly you know there was no one else really to run after IKEA and all the big like, accounts. So Actually, we, we actually managed to, I think we put on maybe 75 or 80, you know, that, you know, we almost doubled the company after uh, So, actually, it was, you know, yeah, we pulled through the, the, the hardship. Um, so, the, uh, the exit. Yeah, yeah, the exit, okay. So, actually, the, um, the, the foundation of Russia was not with, with what I would do today, you know, you, you, you go out and raise some capital. It was, I had a trading company in Denmark. I saw an opportunity in Russia. I, I met some people that um, expressed direct interest. You know, I was sitting with this, you know, property manager. He was expressing his frustration that he could not provide quality service to his customers. And then I flipped that around and said, "Would you buy from me if I gave you that service?" So uh, yes. So I went in with that with, with gut feeling, you know, and with my heart and not with my mind because. You know, I could not have built a business plan, I could not have gone out and raised money in 95, 96 to build a professional team coming in Russia. I don't think I would have managed that. So I went in with my gut feeling, I went in with my heart and my soul, and I, I used my own means and own capital that I had generated through my other business to do this because I wanted to do this, because I saw a need for it. Um, and it so happened that we then started you know, delivering the services, we grew and grew, especially on the account of clients. Uh, at some point, uh, a manufacturer of equipment called Wilfis Advance, which is a Danish company, uh, the world's largest manufacturer of machinery, came to us and said, you know, guys, we, we have bought electrical logs, we have some the uh, presses in Russia, we don't want to deal with it, we heard about this crazy day who's running a cleaning company, can you help us out? So, on that, we built another distribution company distributing those machinery, so now we have two, two feet in the ground in, in Russia. I, uh, I then hired a CEO, and I need to point this out because uh, there's another uh, lesson to be learned there. And so, in this process of building the company, I. Uh, Why'd you hire a CEO? Well, what was, the, what was the thinking behind that? The thinking was for that that I am um, an incubating CEO. I know my own strength and uh, weaknesses, and I am, I am very much an incubating CEO. I'm, I'm very good on the short lane, I mean, on the 36. Uh, 48 months now. I'm very, very motivated to putting people together, but once it gets him into a, a more administrative uh, phase, I know my own weaknesses, then my, my attention span drops and I want to be you know, dealing with some other things. So, and I wanted to take that company to a, a real first lead. You know, I wanted to be a, the, one of the tier one uh, companies in Russia, and I felt that for that to happen, I wanted to have a, a professional CEO to, to help me get up to the first lead. And I was presented with an American uh, MBA uh, business administrative uh, manager who had a, a track record of working with uh, companies and having taken it from, from uh, B to A, etc. etc. Et so we did some interviews and I, uh, I went with the guy. Um, and uh, okay, I must have been also my gut feeling there. After a few months already, I started to feel that there was something that was not kosher. And um, unfortunately, it ended up in that, uh, that this uh, particular guy uh, one more time emptied the bank account. We, um, we had, uh, you still in Russia at that time, you, you couldn't pay salaries by credit card or by transfers into bank accounts or debit card or anything. So you still paid them a large amount of cash. And um, for whatever reason, this person thought that it was better that he kept the cash over the Christmas and holidays. And, uh, 
for some reason, he found out that the casinos needed to catch more than he needed them. So he went up and, uh, and spent the money in, uh, in three days in casinos. I <laughs> you covered this. Well, that is, uh, that is the beauty of Russia, I guess. You know, everything is possible. So, uh, with a bit of help, you can get the CCTV footage cameras from the police, you can get the uh, security surveillance cameras from the casino, and you can get the mobile phone tracking records so you can see where the person has been. And, when you compile all of that, it's pretty clear what's happening. When you actually see the guy spending your money on the casino and throwing them around and friends and how do you handle something like that? Like that's that's very strange. It's very, very hard because I had first to play the double role against this fraud person, um, not to rock the boat. At the same time I had to run a parallel game of finding out what really happened. Uh, I had to keep a face to customers and you know we had to pick it. To explain to the employees, you know what happened. Now, you know, money was a different story, so we, we could still pay our salaries. But you know, of course, sitting out a hundred plus k out of the account, it, it does make a dent. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it was very, very strange. I mean, in Russia, and at that time, anyway, you don't want to make enemies, um, you know, because so you have to be very careful how you how you deal with this. Yeah. And it was strange, and at some point. I Confronted the person with the, with the evidence, and uh, our part, our ways parted, I would say. So but I have a saying, uh, and, and I think it's important if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. So, you know, you cannot go out and do things that you would not sort of stand up to your own. So, so, would you say you're an entrepreneur? Would you say you can become an entrepreneur? I mean, can everyone do a startup, do you think? Or, if you're saying that you live by the sword, you die by the sword, it's very much. Probably a DNA trait yeah. that you have. Yeah. A lot of people may not think along those lines. Also I, I, um, I don't think entrepreneurs do something you put on by the end of the a jacket that you put on. It's the same with, with honesty. You, know, you don't put on a jacket if you're honest. And then at 6 or 9 o'clock, you are being dishonest to yourself, or to your spouse, or to your friends, or your partner. The same with this with, with entrepreneurs, I, I would say. It's, um, because, you know, and, and aspiring entrepreneurs should know this. I mean, you need to get your partners to understand this because being an entrepreneur isn't 24 7. I, I wake up quarter to seven in the morning and the first thing that hits me is you know what I need to do, what I what I went to bed with last night, thinking that I had to do it. And then I look over at my partner and I say good morning and you don't and it's not because she's less attractive or interesting than my business so it's just this is the nature of how we think and, and it's important for you to get your spouses on board and say, you know, I, I want to I wanna do this and I, I, I burn for it, but you know, I mean, this, you may need to talk to me and I will say, sorry, you know, because this is on your business plan and your meeting tomorrow and the meeting with the bank and the investor and you know, the whole thing. And that I want to think really is assisted. That's going to be a, It consumes your whole day. It consumes your whole day. Yeah. And you have to be a little bit uh, strict on yourself to say, okay, then, you know, now it's family time, turn your phone off, turn it away, and then you have to be strict because otherwise, going to be too much a and your partners are not going to like the so, But it's important to tell them that you want to that you're being an entrepreneur is And the management, management, I would say, I don't know if you agree, is more something after you've done it a couple of times, you can probably manage your time a little better, would you say, so you can turn off that? Sure. I, I mean, if you're going into your first venture, how do you think most entrepreneurs are probably just more I'm full sure. speed in? Yes, I mean, if it's your first try, you know, and, you, yeah. know, you have to give it first. You may always have to give it or everything, but yes, time management is, is, is uh, easier when you have a, a bit of uh, experience and maybe some capital to, to uh, maneuver around with. But um, again, if you get your spouse and your partners to understand that this is, you know, you know 24 months and I'm going to be full on this, and, and they will support you. What's your take on that? Oh yes, I know since you had the guys and taking out money. What's your take on failure? I wrote, I read that you wrote a four times serial. I think the four times are the <laughs> successful ones, and there, there's at least the same unsuccessful ones. I, you know, I have done all the things that didn't work, and, and unfortunately, one of the things that uh, didn't work was in Cyprus. Uh, What's the most notable one? The Cyprus one. Plus the Cyprus one. Yeah, no, no, we can take the Cyprus one. Um, I exited Russia in 2006, roughly. Uh, I took some sabbatical years, to be honest. I, uh, I went to a lot, I cooked a lot, and I did things that I liked. You know, I felt I had 
very amazing. You know, I, had, I had worked hard and I had done an exit and I felt I wanted to reward myself with, with a couple of years of fun. And then came 2009 and said, okay, times. enough of the fun, let's go and build something again. And um, I lived in Cyprus, I looked around, I, I followed the news and I knew that the EU had the 2020 plan, you know, we, we had to have an increase on the production of renewable energy, etc. I looked out, the sun is shining 320 days. Um, I studied the market a little bit and I realized that photovoltaic and PV sector was sort of non existent in Cyprus. So that's where we're going. The politicals are going to you know, create the market for us. Uh, the, the sun is there already, we're not going to do anything about the, the supply of raw material. Uh, and the industry is very mature and it's non existing. So for me, that was a ticking off all the boxes. I wrote a business plan for a setting up and an engineering company in Cyprus uh, to build food faulting small systems or big systems. I um, pitched that to some uh, investors and uh, they liked it, they, they saw the same opportunities as I saw and they also believed in me as, a, as, a, as the lead entrepreneur who could pull it off. How did you find your business that? I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are interested in this. How did you find your investors in from Cyprus? And this particular investor is, uh, is not from Cyprus. So. But still, I mean, if you have know, these entrepreneurs and these entrepreneurs, they're probably saying the same question. How, how do you raise funds being from? You have to get out of Cyprus. And that's, that's one thing I have to say. Um, not get out, I mean, we still stay here, but, but you need to network outside of Cyprus. Uh, you need to build a network. Uh, if it's technology, you have to build a network in London, Berlin, Vienna. Stockholm, uh, I know some of you guys are Swedish, but uh, so there is, there is um, you have to get out of that. And, and simply for that reason that, that the environment in Cyprus um, does not cater for, uh, let's call it venture capital, to, to like a lot of angels or something. Because there, there is not so much venture, okay? If you came with a business plan of a chain of bakeries or something else, you know, this is something that has history, something that you can understand, but we're saying that you know, we need a burn rate of 200k and then we're going to build your value. These are things that does not, you know, that doesn't cater for the locals investors. So, so if you need to raise money, you have to start networking outside. Uh, we've got cheap flights, we can fly with uh, some of the you know, cheap budget airlines to anywhere in, the, in Europe uh, with LinkedIn and all our other networking abilities. You know, you can, Start up building a network and you can join an event there. And, you, know, you know, how much are you going to spend to spend four days in Berlin and maybe meet 200 people or like, get 20 business cards that you can follow up on? So you have to look for that outside. Yeah. Okay, so you pitched to investors, you have to find pitched that to the uh, engineering company to the investor. We got the capital, we hired by far the best team of engineers. So I could have pulled in people from that have built megawatt systems. Greece and Germany and Spain. I feel we put in a engineer with a PhD from the Imperial College in London. We had a world class team in what we believe was a maturing market set by the government and the policies. So we thought we were for a for a whole world year. Um, but what I did not take into account, and this is maybe because I'm a foreigner in this country, was the the um, the lack of inspiration and aspiration by the politi polit uh, politicians and the people who make the, the rules of the government to follow the 2020 rules, to follow the general uh, perception in Europe that we need a renewable energy, to, to see that, that uh, Cyprus would benefit from pursuing, especially for the uh, So, I did not take into account in my business plan the political environment, and that was because I was maybe a bit naive about, you know, everyone can see where this is going, and we have the EU pushing for our, you know. so unfortunately, um, just a year ago, I, I, I closed that company and I had to let go of five people, and uh, say that's it, you know, and, you know, it was the worst case of a lot of money. With that. It's, it's very sad because I myself invested a lot of time in understanding photovoltaic the industry. I, I didn't come with, with any knowledge of that, but you have to read up it, you have to study it. I traveled to you know, a number of conferences and conferences to, 
to, to learn about this industry and, and you, so you put a lot of sweat and, and, uh, and tears into this um, and you fight for it and you believe in it and you, you go and you can speak to politicians and you, you explain them that you know, this is that and you can, um, you can prove that by producing electricity today from the water you know, it will be far cheaper than the EAC and the production cost from the EAC is, is far higher than what it will be on the water today but, but you were just you know, met with the um,
maybe down the road with another company, another five, ten jobs, you know. I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, you know, this is where I live, so I would have created, I don't know, X amount of jobs. But yeah, now I'm just in other entrepreneurs as well. Sure. But now you're discouraged and you are, you know, you'll burn your fingers. So what I'm looking at is, is on a different plane ground. So. So, so, so that point is, is, is a good point, actually, because if you had gotten the support that you needed, because obviously your, your idea was probably the right place at the right time, but you didn't have the right last name, you didn't have the right uh, entry into the government, who knows for the reasons that may be, but if you had gotten to where you could be, a lot of things might have changed. More jobs, more investments, a better type of ecosystem. So now you're discouraged. What's, you move now towards the app space, towards the technology space, software, etc. What's your relation now with Cypress? How are you operating things with Cypress given your, your previous failures? Well, um, everything happens for a reason, and, uh, and, and everyone has to also know that Steve Jobs put a very nice thing. He said it was only based on the life that the dots lined up, and, and, uh, and just have that in mind that everything happens for a reason, even if it looks, you know, devastating or you know, what needs to happen to me, there's a reason behind it, and and. Um, the venture that I'm running today is actually born out of an intern that came to my engineering company. I'm not, you know, so at the end of the day, we can sit back and look at this uh, startup that we have today, which is an, uh, an awesome product and uh, something that we're very excited about. And that came out of that failure of the engineering company because he was an intern that came into the event me, um, and together we developed something together. You know, um, and I can give you the story of. How that, how that came about, and um, this intern uh, came to me and he said, Carlos, I just want to tell you a little bit about what I have done before, you know, getting into this internship and what I did at university. I said, sure, Bobby, so, you know, tell me, tell me what you did. We sat down and, and uh, Bobby told me that when, when he was at the University of Aristotle in uh, Thessaloniki, he wanted to put the bar as high as possible. That was just his character. And he just wanted to make it to not as difficult as possible, but he wanted to put the bar for himself as high as possible. Um, so he told his fellow uh, graduates, he said, why don't we go and compete in robotics? These are electrical engineers, it says on the And I'm sure everyone looked at him and said, are you crazy? But he said, no, let's put the bar as high as possible. Let's build robots and go to the Robocop and compete in Robocop. And he got 20 of his fellow students together. <laughs> Robocop is, uh, you see Robocop, uh, once a year you see them play football. You know, you have a robot playing football and there's a world championship. But there's also a, a Robocop called uh, Search and Rescue. And Search and Rescue is where you have to build autonomous robots that goes in and, and maps out a building or a disaster area or something like that. So, here you have a 24 or 25 year old guy, you know, who managed to pull 20 of his fellow students together to build a robot and go to uh, Robocop and compete in that. Uh, and in eight months, they built the robot and they won the European Championship. And then next year, they went to China in 2009 to compete against Japan and everyone else. So the people were like, how can you come to the league and compete against Japan in making robots? They became number eight in the world, okay, in building the circuit version of the world. And then when I heard that story from Bobby, you know, my entrepreneur brother said, okay, there are two things here that are crucial. <clears throat> knowledge, human, uh, you know, human capital, you know, knowledge, know-how, and the power to execute. I mean, pulling 24 to 